I've been wanting to make a video about this for a while, um, so here we are. This is a chain of LED lights, and it's in the bottom of a cork stopper. So I think it's supposed to go into an empty bottle or something and just sort of make it look a bit pretty. But it's got some special things to it. Now, I always like to figure out how things work. So, um, you know, looking at this immediately, you can see that there are these individual LEDs that points down the chain. And you can see that there are two wires, two strands, which kind of tells you that maybe we could have two different sets of LEDs if you reverse, you know, put them in reverse polarity to each other. So if we turn this on, we can see that we get red. And what you actually get is a alternating pattern of red, if you can see that, from one to the other. So every other LED will be on while the other one is off. And that looks quite pretty. And so, yeah, as I said immediately, you can presume that we've just got red LEDs that are placed uh, reversing polarity each time. Um, but this one's a little bit special, because if I turn it off and on again, we get green. <laughs> and if I do it again, we get blue. So there's clearly something happening here which is a little bit more than just alternating the polarity on the wires. This is kind of a yellow, cyan, magenta, and then finally white before we go back to red. So just to show those colours again in a bit of a darker setting, we've got the red, and if I hold the end you can see that we've got this alternating pattern from one you know, from the odd LEDs to the even LEDs. Okay, and then we've got green, blue, yellow, cyan, magenta, and white. And of course, the camera is picking up the PWM that's put onto these LEDs, so you might see some stripes and things on the screen. When we first looked at this, we suspected that maybe there was uh, the two wires with LEDs that have alternating polarity down the chain, and a simple H-bridge would have been able to alter the duty cycle between the odd LEDs and the even LEDs to produce this fade pattern between each, pet or each set. But as we know that there are colours now, uh, there needs to be something more sophisticated going on. So I don't think this is a viable option anymore, and instead I think we probably have some sort of uh, phantom, in inverted commas, communication uh, that's providing power and communicating with each of these little uh, LEDs. Each of the LEDs probably then has some kind of addressing information, um, and um, you know it might be able to control its own PWM, or that might be something that's happening from the controller in here. So the alternating LEDs idea is, is not going to work, but instead what I think is we'll have you know, a supply rail that has uh, some kind of load applied to it or possibly is pulled up with you know, enough capacitance on here to keep the LEDs going. So actually, I'm going to draw them as LEDs, but they're actually clever little devices. And they have each has their own address or possibly you know, there's only two addresses in the system. Um, so let's go and have a look at what that might be doing. Just to give you a little more information on this, in the bung here we, we can pull off the end and reveal a USB, adapt, uh, USB connector which is used to charge the battery that's inside here. If we then pull it apart, um, I've already broken some seals and here we go, then we can find a little tiny battery, a little lithium polymer, and that's a 50 milliamp hour battery. And we also find uh, a switch which is what happens at the end, the rotation of the of this transparent piece here actuates that switch. We've got uh, some diodes, transistors and things here, as well as a little micro probably, which is controlling the colours that are shown. And just to give you a closer view, this is the side which has probably got a micro, and you can see 
we can start to sort of make some deductions about the circuit that's here. Um, and I'll, I'll draw it out on a piece of paper in a minute. Uh, on the back, then, we have that. Up in the corner here, we have what looks like a transistor and a resistor on one of the wires. So this, this top wire, I suspect, is just going to be a simple ground um, supply to the chain of LEDs. And the top one, uh, I suspect we have some kind of uh, you know, voltage supply here, uh, number V1 maybe, and then we have probably V2 perhaps with uh, a resistor and some kind of transistor that can pull on that to uh, you know, transfer the data. So actually we never lose power to the chain, we just change the supply voltage and that's what the LEDs then use to infer their commands. Just before we hook up the scope we need to determine what's what. So I've got multimeter here with uh, its beep mode and you know everyone's familiar with them. If I take the USB uh, connectors, sh can, shield, whatever you want to call it, uh, and try poking around here. I think one of these two will probably be directly to ground and it turns out that actually the bottom pad here is indeed ground, which means that this up higher or you know the upper wire is the one that's probably got the supply and some kind of communication going down it. So we'll hook up to the scope now and have a look see what that says for us. Now because these wires are actually insulated um, I'm actually going to use the USB shield as the ground point and then I'm going to put a tiny little wire coming off the exposed solder and pads here rather than stripping off the shielding or the insulation sorry Okay, so I've done the soldering, there's a little tiny wire on there now, it's a little bit too short, but uh, never mind. Got the ground lead coming to the USB shield, and the scope probe going to that uh, special wire. Now I've just hooked up the ground and the, the end of the scope probe to our, sort of our device, and you can immediately see this 50 hertz signal coming through. Obviously if I come close then that will change quite dramatically. Um, now I suspect that the reason this is coming through is because actually the uh, the powered rail that we were looking at earlier on the uh, on the chain is high impedance at this point, so there's nothing you know holding it at a particular voltage. Um, and if we look at this, we've got 500 millivolts per division, so there's actually about 500 millivolts of signal on here. If I now turn the system on, uh, we should hopefully see a nice strong signal, and I suspect that that will go away. There we are. Now you can immediately see that there's a lot of stuff going on on this supply rail, and that there's an offset. There's about a one and a half volt uh, baseline here, and then there's a further sort of one and a half ish volts up to the top. Now we're running from a LiPo, which typically has a voltage range of about 3.7 to 4.2, but actually LiPos can go much deeper than 3.7 volts, and this hasn't been charged for a while. So, you know, the 3.1, 3.2, whatever we might have up here, it could well be the LiPo directly supplying these, this chain of LEDs. Now when you're using a scope, uh, obviously the most important thing is triggering because you can't really make sense of anything without getting uh, you know good view on what you're looking at but already just free running at 10 milliseconds per division we've got this interesting pattern coming out and if I hold up the LEDs you can actually see that that is directly related to what's happening on the chain So now we'd like to trigger correctly, and we'd like to make the best use as possible of this information. Um, this offset here is not really relevant to us, we don't care about that, so we can just wind it down, or we can use AC um, coupling, which should get rid of the offset. There we go. And obviously our, our reference point now is in the centre of the signal. Now at this point we want to trigger correctly, so uh, what we can do is just zoom in a bit, 
and press uh, start stop and just see what we get on the screen. And there we go, so there's lots of these transitions and then there's this burst of information and that actually happens relatively frequently. And you can see burst, burst, burst and all of these other transitions here. Okay. Now those bursts of information is what we're really, really interested in and the dead space, we're going to call it, you know, this standard AC-ish waveform here is, is not in, important or interesting to us. So if we were to zoom in, we can then use the cursors to determine what sort of uh, width these, these pulses are. And if we go for a negative pulse, we can then have a look and say that, well, that easily fits into here. We're looking at about 24 microseconds. So if we set up a trigger with a pul pulse width of less than negative edge, less than 24 microseconds, or say 20 microseconds, then we should get 19.9, that'll do. We should get a good solid trigger on information. Here we go. And if we were to zoom out from there, then you can start to see what's, what's going on. Now, you can also infer things from the height of the waveform at the top here. So if I just press uh, single capture, or stop, sorry. We've got these three different levels, and they're quite distinct. So we might be able to presume that here both LEDs are on, or, you know, the odd and the even set is on. Here only one of odd or even, and here none of the LEDs are on. And that might play into how the PWM is being implemented. Now this, the trigger is still not particularly stable, and so if we zoom out further we can actually see that there's an approximately, what do you think, five and a bit millisecond period here. So for, let's do a single, single capture. From here to here is, let's measure it. Let's go for 6.87 milliseconds. So if we do a few of those we can see that this period is actually very consistent. And we can then roll that information back into the trigger to get a much more stable lock. Using the hold off here, we can set that for, let's go for, I don't know, six milliseconds. And what this means is that once a trigger has occurred, it will not be allowed to reoccur or occur again until six milliseconds. Very fiddly. Let's go for five, six milliseconds. There you go. So if we run again now, and we have a much more stable lock on the waveform. Now the data we're looking at here doesn't differentiate between each of the chains of the LEDs. So there's the odd set and then the even set. And what you actually see is this funny uh, transition about here, doop, and there, doop. And I suspect what's happening is that actually when you get to about 50% duty cycle, things swap and it starts to go the other way again. Now if we want to try and understand the protocol that's being used we have to zoom in quite quite close and here we go. Now that we've identified the single packet here we can start to deduce what the individual bits mean. We can see that the logic low level here is always the same duration but the high level changes. There's a short and long version of it. So we can start to assign values and if we say that a long high pulse is a zero and a short high pulse is a one, then we can start to decode this packet as a digital value. So this packet here might be a 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And if we run a single capture again, we can start to build up a set of packets. So here we've got 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. And again, four zeros, a one, and then three zeros. We've got one of those already, and again. Now, at this point, it might be interesting to note that we have the LEDs configured or set for white. If I turn it off and on again, then we would expect the contents of this payload to change. So I'm just going to turn it off and on again here. Now, this time we have the LEDs set for red. And if we look at this payload a few times, we can see that we've got, that's a familiar one, we've seen that before. Now that is a new one, we haven't seen that before. So we've got a 0000, a 1001. 
And we can start to infer different things from this. So I'm going to record these on a piece of paper. What colour showed us what, which distinctive waveform? And if we turn off and on again a few more times, we should hopefully catch all of them. Now this is green. And you can see here we've got 0000, zero, 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 one, zero, one zero. Off and on again. A few more captures. There we go. Four zeros and a one one zero zero. And that you might have guessed is blue. Off and on again. Now this is yellow. And from the information we've already deduced, we should be able to predict what value we will see. Yellow is made up of red and green, so I suspect we'll see 0000101. Zero, 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 one, zero, one, one. And there it is, four zeros, one zero one one, and that's yellow. Now the reason I was able to determine or predict that is that I've in my head assigned you know different meanings to each of these bits. I suspect what we have is a five bit address and then a three bit color option field. Let's do the other colors quickly and um, let's try to decode the full message. This is cyan. There we go, one one zero. Oh sorry, one 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 zero. And what's cyan made of? It's made of green and blue, and that matches up with our expectations. Off and on again. This is magenta. There we go. One one zero one. Magenta is of course uh, red and blue. And so that matches up nicely. And then one last one to catch the white. There we go. There we are, one, 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 one. Coming back to the paper that I've just been recording the values onto, we can start to see a real pattern here. We've got uh, this bit, this column, bit zero, let's call it, is the red flag. So anywhere that we have a color which contains red, like yellow, magenta, white, and of course red, that value is a 1. The same is true then for the green and the blue, and the, the high five bits I suspect are an address. So if we start to write this down as a packet, we've got the 8 bits of data, we've got uh, what I think is an address, 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 and then we've got uh, red, green and blue. Oh sorry, that's not quite on camera. Now the last bit of information that we need to keep from the current implementation if we're going to hope to drive this chain ourselves is the timing. The high and low uh, values, the durations, are potentially quite important for these LEDs. I don't know how they run but I suspect that the clock is provided as part of that AC waveform we saw earlier. So if we go back to the scope and record those values, um, I'm just going to do this off camera if that's okay. Okay, so I've recorded the information from the scope. We've got uh, the duration of the data low period, the data high for a zero, the data high for a one, and then the AC or probably a clock signal, which is uh, not quite a 50-50 uh, a split between high and low. The other key information that we obviously don't have because we don't have data sheet or anything is what voltage to run these at. Uh, the low signal is a really solid 1.5 volts, while the high is somewhere between 2.5 and 2.9 volts. I wonder if this will become much more solid when we plug it into a, a USB supply or if actually that's uh, varying because it's through a resistor. So let's do that quickly now. Okay, so we're connected to an anchor battery pack now and the red light you can see shining off the table surface is just the LED to indicate that it's charging. If I hold this onto the, at the USB CAN, then we can see that on the scope the voltage is still uh, changing within a range. So that almost confirms for sure that this is through a resistor for the high voltage and just a solid 1.5 volts for the low.
Just to point this back at the scope very briefly, I've removed the AC coupling so you can see that the 1.5 volt bottom is still there, it's actually slightly higher now, and the top is actually uh, quite a bit higher, so it's come all the way up to approximately 3.1 volts, and I would imagine that that would rise as the battery charges. I think we've now got all the information we need to reproduce a controller for this chain of LEDs. We've got the timing information, the voltage, as well as the protocol, which was a nice simple one to uh, reverse engineer. Hopefully we'll get uh, a new controller with some rainbow going, and um, if anybody has any ideas what these LEDs are, I did have a quick look, but not very thorough, um, it'd be really interesting to hear. Um, you know, as I suspect, there's a 5-bit address here, which means that you might have some interesting options for uh, you know, long chains of individually addressable LEDs. Thanks for watching and see you next time.